Hey, what's going on everyone? This is Mike Colleen at MikeColleen.com. And the name of the song is called Escape by Seferos. Okay, so today's video is going to be about God's coming to get you. And God's bringing, bringing you justice. If God hasn't already brought you some justice, he's going to bring you some more. God's leaving the 99 to get the one. I'm going to tell you a real life experience <clears throat> and then something I learned later on on the exact same experience I had. Uh, studies that have been done in psychology, something I learned in psychology class and in obviously from, from reading the book too, the, the psychology book at the time. One of the things that empaths have is they call it imposter syndrome. Now imposter syndrome is when it, you know, to me it doesn't sound like what it is until someone explains like, no, 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 it's the other way around. Like, what do you mean? Like imposter syndrome, like, okay, like a narcissist, okay, here's the opposite. A narcissist will be an imposter. They'll be fake. That's not what it means. Imposter system means, okay, so like, okay, I, I, I had just won the state championship in boxing, right, when I was a kid. And the next morning, I went out for a bike ride and I stopped at the school, which was only like one block away. It's on the other side of the block and then just straight up the block on the other end. And it was a Saturday, I think, maybe a Sunday. It was the weekend and I was there by myself. It was about noon, I guess, 1130 in the morning. <clears throat> and a few minutes later, my brother Gary had uh, pulled up on his bike and he says, you know, why don't you just quit boxing? And I'm looking, I'm like, what? I'm thinking, I just won the state championship last night. I'm not going to quit boxing. He goes, he, and I go, why? And he goes, well, because you suck. I was like, what? He goes, you're no good. He goes, why don't you just quit? He goes, you've been practicing for what, a year and a half now? He goes, you're no good. Why don't you just quit? Now, mind you, I literally just won the state championship the night before. And I'm looking at him like, hey, what do you mean I'm no good? I go, I, maybe I'm not Muhammad Ali or, you know, I, I named off another professional world champion fighter. But I'm pretty good. And he goes, and I go, I'm pretty good for my age and for the level I'm at. And he goes, no, nah. he goes, you suck. Now, I can laugh now about it, but back then, he made me feel one millimeter tall. I just felt so low. So, that's how they give you imposter syndrome. You do something great, you get good grades, you, do, you learn something new, and they come and, de and what they're doing is they're devaluing it, and they're devaluing your feeling about it. So I was pretty young when this happened. I was probably about 12 years old, something like that, maybe 11 and a half. And he, so he was a year and a half older. So he's only probably about 12 or 12 and a half, 13. So I'm like, you know, you look back like, like these little kids do this. Yes, he was definitely a narcissist. So that's how you get imposter syndrome is every time you do something great, they make you feel like, yeah, you're not worthy. You're no good. And so here you are like, a, like the best in the state at something that you do. And they're like, yeah, you're no good. And you, and so what happens is in your own mind, you think, well, I'm actually not that good. I, I'm actually no good at this. And a lot of times people will re be really, really good at something, school, at art, at music, at boxing, sports, uh, work, business, but, th but, and they could get all the awards and accolades, but they end up walking away feeling like, well, I'm no good at anything. So that's imposter syndrome. So now let me go into this. So when I was about, I think I was in 10th grade, maybe the summer after 10th grade. So I was probably, I think 16 at that time, fairly, fairly young guy. And I went and worked at a feed store, Wilson's Feed in Napa. Uh, great family, love the family. Dad could be a little bit harsh. <laughs> you 
you know, it's funny. You look at the them like mom and dad, and then their their children, uh, Tim and Wendy. They were like your older brother and sister. To this day, they still act like they're my older brother and sister, and and they still call me Mikey. They're like Mikey, and they literally say it like that. I went I went and visited for the first time about I think it was last year, so about nine months ago. And literally, the mom, the son, the, they're like Mikey, and I'm like, Frick, I'm 55 years old. I'm not a little kid. But you know what they lit and I said something about that and they say, Mikey, you're always gonna be Mikey to us. And that was just a very loving, you know, adoration kind of thing. Alright, so now this is a feed store. They have a ranch and they're used to dealing with like, you know, uh farm animals, pigs, uh ducks, chickens, you know, all this stuff. They've been doing it their whole life. So it's kind of a rough business and you kinda of gotta be hard nosed, cold at times. So one day it was kind of um, not really my turn, but something came up and I learned a hard, hard lesson. So being the youngest one there and the newest one there, I had to had some chores. So when you first show, you got this list of things you got to feed the chickens, you got to clean out the pens, you got to, you know, to just do things. And so I was feeding the little baby chickens that are stacked in these little uh, incubation thing. They're warm and they're stacked so i mean it was peak season for when people came to buy baby chickens it might have even been for easter i'm not really don't remember what exactly why we had so many but we had a ton of chickens baby chickens and i mean probably 40 times five so at least 200 plus i don't remember how many but we had a lot and so i noticed that um when i was feeding them like all the all the chickens in this one bin were pecking at this one baby chicken. So they're, they're all little baby chickens. They're only, you know, about three inches tall or something and running around and, you know, fully strong and everything. And they're pecking and pecking. I'm like, oh my God. So I reached in and grabbed the chicken because they were going to kill it. They were going to kill it. And Mr. Wilson, I, thi I think I called him over. I said something. He goes, hey, what's going on? And and I said, hey, man, they're picking, they're picking on this chicken, you know. And so in, in my mind's eye, there's a box right next to the, the chicken pins or bends or whatever they're called. And I'm thinking, I'll just put some uh, hay in there, put some feed and a little water thing in there. And I'll just leave it in there for a couple of days. And Mr. Wilson grabs it. And he looks at it. <laughs> this is going to shock you. So prepare yourself. Seriously. He grabs it and just whack, he whacks his head on the metal thing and kills it. And I'm like, oh my God, now I was a little kid and I was not expecting it. That kind of, that shocked the shit out of me. Now, normally I'm like really respectful, kind of keep my mouth shut, but I was like, fuck that. I was like, Mr. Wilson, why did you do that? And he looks at me, he goes, Michael, he goes, they were going to torture this. It was going to, they were going to peck at it and peck at it until it finally died about two or three days later. And it would have literally been just sitting there getting pecked and helpless, you know, because it, it would have been pecked so bad. It would have been just like laying down, still alive and suffering. And they would have kept on pecking on it until it was dead. So I do understand logically he was saying, you know, we're basically saving it a, a lot of pain. And I said, but Mr. Wilson, I could have put it in a box and I could have done it. He goes, Mikey, we've been doing this for over, I think at that point, probably 25 years. A lot. His whole life he's been doing it, probably longer than that. And he tried to explain it to me and I still didn't really agree. And then I, I remember Timmy was like, Mikey, what's wrong? And this was probably a, an hour later, or a day later, I don't remember. And I, I explained the situation. He goes, Mikey, you got to understand. He goes, I was like that when I was a kid too. He goes, but you don't understand like we would have to take all these chickens and all these separate boxes he goes mikey it's a it's a big mess <clears throat> it's a big pain in the ass and we don't have the manpower to take care of all these chickens separately so i do remember asking mr wilson why i think i asked him this before he killed it i go why are they doing this he goes well it's got a, a little speck of blood on it now you gotta understand this was literally a tiny tiny little speck i'm i'm kind of surprised they saw it when I say they, I mean the other little baby chickens. And he, he I go, but like, what, why do they care? Like, why? I don't understand. This doesn't make sense. It's because they think it's a bug or something. Goes, no. He goes, it's because it's different than the other ones. And, and if anything is different and stands out, then they kill it. So I just thought that was really weird. And then about, I don't know, three or four years later, I was in psychology class in college. 
and we had a chapter specifically on this very exact thing about baby chickens. And it, it didn't necessarily have to have a, a little spot of blood or an injury. It, it, it could be just anything. If they were just different, the rest of the herd would just pick at it until it was dead. And that's it's and they, and they applied this to psychology and how if you're different somehow, then the group, if you stand out, then the group is going to beat you down. So if I remember right, one of the reasons why is if it, if a baby chicken's different, it's kind of like like weeding out the weak, you know, if something's injured, well, you got to get rid of it because it's gonna it's gonna bring the herd down. Or if the DNA is not good, then that's not good to inter to breed with because you want to breed with the smartest and the strongest and the fastest, you know, for to continue the species. So essentially, this is why humans, um, until recently, were very smart. I mean, the majority of people because. You had to be smart to survive. You really didn't have a choice. So people that were not smart, for the most part, well, they died off. And up until recently, people used to, the average person, I'm not talking about the professional athletes, you know, basketball players, boxers, football. The average person used to be really strong and they would fight back because if they didn't, they would get destroyed. One way humans die is they die emotionally and you can tend to shut down and literally die. Suddenly you can't get the work done in order to get paid. Now you don't got money for food. Now you live in, you know, out homeless, etc. And essentially this is why most homeless people are homeless is because emotionally they're just completely destroyed. Some of them or a lot of them did it through drugs, but probably what led them to drugs was emotional issues, etc. Now I'm not giving them excuses, but one thing that I've noticed in life is it really comes down to your emotional self-esteem, like your inner emotional well-being. If you have a strong inner emotional well-being, you'll do well. Now, one of the things about humans, uh, or sorry, I should say empaths, is one of our mistakes that, now if you've gone through this real, real bad narcissistic attack and you survived, one of the biggest lessons, and I put it on this video series, in fact, I just repeated it recently a couple maybe videos back, maybe a week ago, is you have to really realize you've got to stop looking at humans and, and looking only for the best in people. And that's one of our problems. Because like I said, told you about my mom, you know, two of the mentors that she picked for me was Adolf Hitler and um, Charles Manson. And I'm not kidding. Now, being the narcissist, she would always tell everybody. I'm telling you right now, if you and I went to my mom's place, well, she's dead now, but if we went there, I, I would bet my friends 20 bucks. I got, I, I, at one point, I, I bet my friend Greg 40 bucks. I said, you watch. Within 15 minutes or less, I, could, I go 12 minutes. And within 12 minutes or less, by the time we walk in the door and she greets you, she's going to sit you down, look you in the eye, and she's going to change her tone of voice, and she says... No matter who they are, you've always got to look for the good in them. You've always got to look for the good in them. And then, now, because in your brain you're thinking, like, what if they're a bad person? And this is exactly what you start to think. And the moment you start to think that, she goes, even Charlie Manson, as horrible of a person as he was, as bad things as he did, he still has good in them. And you have to look for that. And then she'd bring off Adolf Hitler and the horrendous things he did. And you've always got to look for the good in, in him too. Because there's good in everybody. Now what this is, it's a hypnotic brainwashing device to teach you to only look for good in people. So this happens to a lot of empaths. I know because I've had a lot of clients over the last few years who have said, man, that's exactly what happened to me. I only saw, like somebody could literally, now I'm gonna tell you right now, somebody literally stabbed me at a high school dance. Somebody I never knew, never saw. He came up from behind, stabbed me in the side of the leg and ran off. I, did, had, I, I, I had no idea who did it. And then uh, come Monday morning, some kid said, yeah, it was so-and-so. Uh, he gave me his name and said, yeah, yeah, this guy stabbed you. And he goes to Napa High. And I'm like, why? Now, that's the crosstown, our crosstown rivalry. I'm like, well, why did he stab me? He goes, well, he's jealous of you. I'm like, who is this guy? Like, I, I had no idea who he was. So here's the weird thing. I think it was like a week later, 
Um, sometimes we would do high school dances where we, we both high schools go to the one high school and the next week we go to the other one. And this was one of those dances and I believe it was at their high school and someone goes, yeah, that's him right there. So I walked right up to him and I gave him a hug. Now you gotta understand, I was the captain of the football team. I was benched, I think, I think in high school, 325 and just a lot. I was a tough dude on the wrestling team. And I could have easily wiped the floor with this guy, but I gave him a hug and said, hey man, it's okay, no worry. He, he never even said, I'm sorry, nothing. I'm just saying, hey man, don't worry about it, it's all good, blah, blah, blah. Now, he just kind of walked away and he, he had this really shocked, lost, like, huh? Like, I was expecting that guy to cuss at me or kick my ass or... And so, this sounds nice and good and wonderful, but let me tell you the downside of, of it. You never learn how to stand up for yourself socially and publicly. You never learn how to have boundaries. And so instead, you it's like when you're you're conditioned to always see the good in people. It's not it's part of our nature. It really is part of our nature to just see the good in people. So I think narcissists do condition it to us because they know like this is a part of our heart. It's a part of our DNA. We, it's our our spirit. We were born with this. So they just condition it in. Oh, even if Adolf Hitler, you always got to see the good in people. You always got to look hard for it to the extent to where you only see the good and someone literally could stab you or cut you with a knife in a mean, in a violent way and you want to give them a hug. Your survival instincts are not very good. Your awareness instincts suck. And you're like, but I'm an empath. Like, we have greater awareness than others. Like, yeah, you're right, but you're not listening to it. So, if you learn this lesson, your emotional well-being will suddenly start to get a lot better. And here's what it is. And here's the lesson. So, I, essentially, God comes after you and teaches you this lesson. And that's God bringing you back. And God also realizes something about you that's very, very special. So the lesson that you finally learn is you have to see people for who they are. The good, the bad, the ugly, the right, the wrong, the lies, the truth, all of it. That's how you judge a, someone's character. That's how you make a decision like, am I going to allow this person to get into my life or not? Or am I going to open up to them or not? So as an empath, you've really got to start protecting yourself emotionally and physically. Along with that lesson is the realization, the lesson that not all people are like us because that's what we do we project this kindness compassion loving overlooking people's you know faults and the bad things they do to us and we have very good intentions towards others in fact we really go out of our way to show people and express to people like hey i have nothing but good intentions here and let me prove it to you and we will we will put up someone's uh, attacking us and, and harming us for months even years and even longer than that till we find like, yeah, I give up on this person. And then you walk away lost and confused. Like, why were they so mean? I, I was I, I was so nice to them. They kept hurting me and screwing me over and setting me up and talking behind my back. And here's the lesson. Part A, not everybody is like you. Not everyone is like us. Meaning... They don't have good intentions towards you at all. So part B is, it is really hard for an open-hearted, loving person who comes from their heart to even imagine, let alone realize like, oh, so you're telling me those people have bad intentions on purpose? Yes. And that's what happened. You got connected with a, a, a narcopath, which is a narcissist who's also a psychopath, who's from the very moment they saw you at the store across the street, you were their target and they were going to destroy you. But they didn't come up and tell you that. They smiled. They might have bought you dinner. They may have been kind and introduced you to their evil friends and they all smiled. You had to learn to see beyond the fakeness, beyond the mask. So just like this beautiful young lady in this picture, she stands out and they all can see that. The problem is you couldn't see it. In fact, I'm just really, 
in the last two years really realizing how people look at me like I could be dressed in sweats not taking a shower for 24 hours stumbling into a store and people just stare at me I'm like and I remember this started happening I became very I don't know if it, it increased but it really started happening about five plus years ago and I would like what and I would even I, I hate to say it but I would even cuss people like what the fuck are you staring at because it was kind of creepy Okay, I had a conversation with a good friend all the way from high school just yesterday. And we had Spanish class together, and I think we had math class together, and then we had uh, wrestling together, okay? And I forget, he goes, I remember you, man. You were just like this guy. You really stood out, man. I'm like, I did? He goes, oh, yeah, you know, everyone noticed you. And I'm like, wow, because that's not the way I felt, because everyone treated me like shit. And I mean like shit. But before I said that to him, he said, yeah, he goes, you know, you were just this blonde blue guy. You're just a good looking guy, athletic muscular. But so was he, though. That was kind of weird because the guy was also blonde. I don't know if he had blue eyes, but he was muscular, athletic. You know, he, I think he was actually an inch taller than me. And he goes, he goes, yeah, but everyone liked you and everyone. And, and he goes, you could just tell you just had this really easy laid back life. And I'm thinking I had an easy laid back life. What the fuck is this guy like? What? And he said, you were just always happy and blah, blah, blah. And, and Now, here's the funny thing. He said, he goes, to be honest with you, I was actually pretty jealous of you in high school. I'm like, seriously? Because the guy started on the varsity wrestling team. Um, he was a little older than me, a grade or two ahead, and he was better than me. And I'm like, what the fuck are you jealous of me for? He goes, well, you know, captain of the football team, captain of the wrestling team, this, this, that. And I'm like, Okay, and he goes, you kind of look like Spicoli in that movie, just kind of this really happy guy, got along with everyone. Well, here's the funny thing. That's the side that everybody saw. Because I was always trying to get along with everybody. But because everyone looked at me like, oh, you just got this great life. And I, here's the deal. I told him what my life was like. He goes, man, I did not know that. And I started telling him some things that all these teachers did to me, these coaches, and just things in life in general. He goes, dude, I did not know that. I'm like, dude, my, I go, why do you think I moved out of Napa? Why do you think I don't go back there? I go, dude, people treated me like shit. And so he's like, I never saw that. He goes, this, when I saw you, I just assumed you were just this lucky guy. So I said, I don't think you understand every class, every period, every lunch, every day. It was a teacher. It was another student. Then it was another one. And it's like, I had no idea your life was... I was like, dude, it was, it was fucking horrible. So, you know, as an empath, I tried to make friends with everyone, which just pissed him off even more. And that's what he said. He goes, it's like you were friends with everyone. And he goes, dude, I was just so jealous of that. He goes, I didn't really hate you or nothing, but I, he goes, I can understand why people would. So here's the deal. You stand out. You always have, even when you're sick, when, even when you're overweight, even when you're hurt, even when you're you're emotionally in pain, you stand out. And here is the thing that's going to be kind of a weird psychological understanding. If you stand out because you're more beautiful than others, because your skin is just smooth and you are flawless, their an now listen, their animal instinct kicks in and they want to kill you. And it's just like the baby chickens. They just peck at you and peck at you and peck at you. But no one else sees anyone else doing it. They only think, well, this... And I've had people say this to me. Like, I'm going to fuck you over. I'm going to hurt you because you're so lucky. You don't, they, they would say, you don't know what it's like to live like us. To like the, to live like the average person. And I just want to go, you couldn't have lived 60 days in my shoes. Not even 30 days. And that's something I began to realize, and, I, and I'm going to give you a couple examples. So the, the last four years or so have really been a clarifying, eye-opening experience for me. So he said to me, he goes, you know, my only problem in high school was I had this one guy. Every year he wanted to fight me, and every year I would punch him you know, in the mouth or in the nose and he would quit and blah, blah, blah. And so the fourth year, my senior year, 
I grabbed the guy, brought him up to the dean, and said, this guy won't stop fighting me. And, it, and I'm like, once a year? He goes, yeah, once a year. I go, that's it? He goes, yeah. So compare it to what I was going through on a... Now, you know, gotta understand, it wasn't just a daily basis. It was almost every class, almost every break, every lunch, every practice. It was always some shit. And all these people over the years, I wouldn't say all of them, but a lot of them, like I'd bump into at a store or in another city or, you know, Disneyland, I bumped into someone and they just said, you know, I'm sorry I was so mean to you, but you're like, dude, your life was so easy. Like it was just unfair. I'm like, my life was so easy to hell. And then I would explain to them like, oh, Jesus Christ, I had no idea. So you know how they always say, even psychologists, like, oh, well, the reason why narcissists are narcissists because they were so abused and traumatized in childhood. Well, I'm going to tell you something right now. Like, none of my siblings were, were beaten, I mean, just m completely tortured, etc. Anywhere near, maybe 10% of what I went through. And I, have, I had a couple of people call me a couple of years ago that ended up being narcissists, and they, they admitted it. And one of them got literally said, when I explained to him, literally just, we talk, I, I talked to him for about an hour, but let, let me tell you what my life was like. And I, I, would, I only get, shared with him about maybe one and a half percent. And he goes, Jesus Christ, he goes, you're unstoppable. Or unbre he was either unstoppable or unbreakable. And he was telling me how hard his life was. And here's the thing, like his life wasn't hard at all. Like he realized, he goes, oh my God, I always thought that I had this hard life ago. No, I go, you had literally a blessed life. Like, you had a really wonderful life. His complaints were literally about nothing. And he would complain about the dumbest things like, that's a problem for you? Wow. God, I wish I had that problem. That's it. God, you're so lucky to be able to make that much money. And he had his condo paid off. He uh, didn't have a car payment. I mean, all this stuff. And I'm like, so what's the problem? I, I hadn't seen the problem. It was a really blessed life. Even himself, he goes, man, I never realized how lucky I had it. I'm like, yeah. So here's the thing. Because I'm an empath, I always want to get along with people. So I, I, I work on being happy. I work on it. But they, they don't. So they make this magical, massive assumption. Well, you know, Michael, you, you know, I want to teach you a lesson because, you know, you, you, you haven't suffered like the rest of us. And then when they find out my life story, like, oh, my God, I'm like a little crying baby compared to like, yeah, you are like literally like that's all. And I would I remember saying like, that's it. And this wasn't the only person. I mean, over the years, I've worked with dozens, hundreds of people who were like, well, what do you mean that's it? I'm like, well, here, let me share my story. Like, oh, my. And some people would literally cry when they heard the stuff I had gone through. And yet, the six months or six years before that, they did everything in their power to make me miserable, to hurt me, to get me fired, to get me suspended. Just every, and and you know, th those aren't even the bad things I went through. <laughs> that's that's nothing compared to what I've been through. So my point is this: you were picked out. You were the little chicken that had that little little tiny you know scratch or blood. And they beat on you, and you were too, you know, you were taller than them. Oh, well, you, who do you think you are? Oh, you, and you might even intimidate them because you were tall, but you were nice, and you got beaten down emotionally because everyone around you beat you down. You were, I don't know, you were super smart at math. You were really good at art. You were really good at sports or, or, or something. There's something about you that stood out. And here is, I'm going to say it again. This is, okay, this is inside our reptilian brain, that lower reptilian brain. Most humans, most of the time, are operating off of this lower reptilian brain. They have even accessed their logical brain, let alone their emotional, spiritual right brain, the artistic brain, the creative brain. Psychologists for probably centuries have said, you know, the majority of people, 91 plus percent of people are operating off of the, you know, they call it, they're in the rat, they're in the rat race. Like everyone's trying to screw everyone over. Everyone's trying to kill each other. Everyone's trying to get each other fired and, and blame each other because they're operating off of this low, like, oh, you're different than me. Yeah. And the whole group is, yeah, they're weird. They're, they're not like us. And so they go in for the kill. And because of this, you were the one that was chosen. 
and you were the one that God left the herd for, the 99, and came back to get you. But the reason is going to be kind of shocking. So here's what it says, or, you know, like what it means. Like, and this isn't what it says in the Bible. So this is Matthew 18, verse 12. If a man has 100 sheep, but one of the sheep is lost, what will he do? He will leave the other 99 sheep on the hill and go look for the lost sheep. So most Christians will, <clears throat> will paint that out as, yeah, you're the lost sheep. You know, you're the one who doesn't get it. When in fact, you were the one who got it all along, and that's why they didn't like you, because you were different. It's the same thing in Mother Nature, like the, the albino anything is in more danger. The albino giraffe, the albino tiger, the albino um, moose, because they can see you better. You stand out, and predators will go after you. It's the whole reason why Jesus was killed. He stood out. He was different. So all your life, all these people beat you down because in their eyes, you're different. But here's what was different. So sheep can't think for themselves, okay? So the herd, the 99, they can't think for themselves. It's group think. And God knows this. You are the one who was strong enough and continued to think for yourself. They can't. You also stayed open. They didn't. They closed up, and that's what put them in their logical mind, and that's what does external group think. What do you think? What do you think? They weren't listening to God because your right brain is the emotional brain, the spiritual brain that's open to God. You were the only one through all the beatdowns, not just the verbal, emotional, and the shame, but also the physical attacks, the beatings, the poisonings, the gaslighting, the mind, all, all the cruel, sick things they did. They gave you worse grades. They they hurt you. They, they screwed you over in sports. They screwed you over in your scholarships. But you still stayed open emotionally. Now, what is that? You were the one who didn't hide from God. You were the one that stayed open. And the rest of the group looked at you and you go, Oh, God, they're so lost. They don't get it. They were purposely traumatizing you, hurting you, being unfair to you. Even your friends at school and the, some of the teachers and on and on and on. They bullied you to death. They did some of the most screwed up shit that would make anyone freaking die. That would make you give up. And that was the goal. See, this is why opening up spiritually, waking up spiritually is really hard. Oh, but a lot of people, oh yeah, because now they want to fit in. Because it's group think, oh, I'm spiritually awake. Oh, I'm woke. Oh, I'm woke. Whoa means you're looking down a tube, which means you're still stuck in your logical brain, which is connected to your reptilian brain. Which means you're asleep. You're not away. Away is an open vowel. O is a closed circuit, like you're looking down a tube. So awake. So you were open hearted. And that's what made you different. You, th you were tuning into yourself, listening, hmm, well, what do I think about that? And right there, they're like, what's wrong with them? Why aren't they like us? Here's the deal. A Christian would take the side of a Muslim over you. Even if you went to church every Sunday, Bible study every Monday and Wednesday, you lived with the pastor, prayed with the pastor every day, had dinner with the pastor every day. A Christian would take a Muslim side because a Muslim is like them. They're very left brain. They're rule oriented. They think it's about rules. They think they can buy God off. They think they can pay God off by living a perfect and sinless life. And everyone in the Bible knows this. Now they might say this logically, but they don't actually believe it. You know that God loves you. They don't. And that's what makes you stand out. And they don't like that. You're a spiritual person because you're open to your heart. Open hearted people are open to the spirit. They're logical. They look at you like they're different. And now we have to go. Now, I'm not, I'm not even saying that it's a logical thing. They just look at you like, oh, you're weird. You're different. And they'll even tell you, oh, you're weird. You're, any opportunity to tell you that you're weird. How many of you heard them say that to you? Like your entire life. You were pushed down. You were beaten. You were pushed out. Literally, you were pushed out of the out of the group. You weren't allowed in. Like, yeah, you, you might have gone to the parties or you're on the team, but you were never part of the group. 
What they never tell you about that one sheep that God goes and looks for, leaving the 99 behind, is that sheep got kicked, he got rammed, he got punched, he got hit, he got attacked, he got bitten by everybody, and he walked away because he couldn't take it anymore. And that's what showed God your strength. You would rather leave the group than close your mind and close off from God than stay with the group. You would rather stay open to God and spirit and your own heart. See, you got to understand, you're the chosen one. They're not. God literally left them for you, not because you're lost, but because you're found, because you're on the path of righteousness, you always have been. And because they're, see, they're the sheep that are going over the cliff. And they're looking at you running the other way, like, where are you going? It's this way. You're like, dude, there's a cliff over there. No, there's not. You're, dude, I'm telling you, there's a cliff over there. Don't go. And they, they're like, no, no, we all believe that's the path. And you're like, all right, well, God's telling me to go this way. So good luck with that one. You cannot be open to God if you are closed off from your right brain. The right brain is the open brain. The left brain is the closed in the box thinking. It traps you. It cuts you off from God. The right brain is literally the em, um, emotional, creative, spiritual brain. And when Jesus says spirit and truth, this is what he's talking about. So here's what happened. Cain killed Abel. So the seed of Cain and the seed of Seth are on the planet but Seth and Abel were good Cain was the evil one he had the evil seed so this seed is getting interbred into humans and mixed in our families and, and etc and so you ever read in the Bible towards the end where it says God is going to separate the wheat from the chaff or the wheat from the, the oh man I just forgot it so there's a separation going on, and we're there right now. We have been separated. you got people on the left, people on the right, and people are suddenly becoming very, very spiritual. And then there's people like, oh, I'm not. I, I don't believe in Jesus, and I don't believe in God. And it's really, there is a clean, clear-cut division, and this is what was necessary. When the sheep, and they are sheep, the closed-minded ones, the timid ones, the cowardly ones, that all herd together like little scared sheep, when they beat you and kicked you and punched you, you're weird, you're different, get away from us. When they pushed you out, they revealed you. And now, God found you. So here you are walking all alone, instead of being mixed in with hundreds and hundreds of sheep, and God can't find you. He's like, well, which one's one of mine? Which one's one of mine? The rest of them are the seed of Seth. Or I'm sorry, the seed of Cain. You are the seed of Seth. See, the seed of Cain had to mix with humans because otherwise they couldn't survive on the planet. Now, you know how people talk about the narcissist eyes and the foreheads all focused? That is the mark that God left on Cain. That's how you recognize them. Their eyes are bulging out, etc., etc. So, here's the deal. God literally chose you. God went and got you. He chose you. He grabbed you. He picked you up. And now he's pulling you back in. Not to the herd, but into his arms and into his heart. All right. So here's another way that you stood out. And this one is the most bizarre one. But this is what... Now, they're looking at you like, oh, they're weird. Oh, they're, oh, they're lost. And here's what it is. So you're the one who was strong enough to continue to think for yourself, to be open-hearted, etc., etc., right? Instead of just blindly following your rules and going along with the, the herd, the sheep herd. So that's why they were harsh on you. Even though they love, okay, watch this. So even though they love your love and receive your positive energy and turn to you for love and nurturing and help and healing, they get mad because you are different. You're not mean like all of them. You're not selfish like all of them. You actually, if they need help, you're the one who shows up and helps them. When you need a sh when when they needed a shoulder to cry on, you're the one who that that lets them cry on your shoulder. When they needed someone to talk to, you're the one that actually talked and cared about them. And that's why you were different, because they're not like that. And they hated you for it. When I say hate, I mean it angered them. And I'm not just talking about narcissists. I'm talking about the herd. What's wrong with them? They're different. 
So like the little baby chickens, it's just instinctual to attack the one that's different. And it doesn't, it doesn't really matter how you're different. Now here's the thing. You were made different from the beginning. You can't not be different. See, a lot of you try to fit in and you try to turn your light down. You try to like not be so happy or not shine so much or not be so enthusiastic. It's still in you. It's like, it's literally like there is a light glowing around you and they can see it. You're different. So don't hide it. Embrace it. Because that's what they want you to do. They want you to let them beat you down. Because see, here's the deal. You're not standing up for yourself because you feel like, well, all these people. Well, but here's something that happens. But See, when you try to turn your light down or hide it or dim your light, you're giving them permission to attack you to beat you down. And that's exactly what's going to happen. But the minute you turn your light back on and you fight back. Now, okay, imagine it. So you, so you got this one little chicken inside this little pen full of at least, say, 35 to 40 chickens. And they're all pecking on it when they walk by it. All you got to do is smack that one chicken upside the freaking head. Peck that other chicken right in the freaking eye. Peck the other one. And also, oh, shit, shit, shit. Because chickens are terrified. And that's something you don't, you've got to, God, you know what? If I could take you to Wilson's feed and, and show this to you and watch it, see that little chicken that little chicken's fighting back and now the other one's like oh shit he's not letting us bully him and that's the secret now they all back off the minute they see like oh okay guess i can't get away with that shit if i pop him he might he's more than likely to pop me right back don't like that and that's the thing you gotta understand these people the sheep the herd they're fucking cowards they're terrified if anyone stands up they're like okay yeah i'm backing down sorry about that and that is exactly the way the majority of people are. One person stands up, one person speaks loudly, 99% of them, okay, gotta get quiet here, okay, shit, sorry, don't want to bother that guy. You have to stand up. It was where you were always meant to be. You have to fight back. You've got to bark back, argue, yell, get loud. The minute, the minute people realize, like, oh, he's not just going to take it, that's when they're like, oh shit, he's actually standing up for himself or she. Like, oh, okay, yeah, I don't want to mess with this person. And that's what happens. They're like, yeah, I don't want to mess with this person. They will only mess with you if they think you're going to let them mess with, with you. That's it. In all sincerity, you are kings and queens and princes and princesses. You always have been. You were meant to be the one. You were meant to be the one to stand up. You were meant to be the one to lead these sheep, not the other way around. God didn't just choose you or choose you. He created you. He just lost you in the herd and he had to find you. And the way he finds you is when you don't give up and then they just peck and peck and peck and they finally push you out of the group and it's like ah there's another one gotcha i'm gonna bring you back home you know i remember when like some of the elders they there was this one church where the, uh, the elders like literally they made a vote and voted me to be the associate pastor and i didn't know anything about it i had no one i did nothing they just one day pastor was hey you know want, want to have lunch with you tomorrow I need to share something with you so here's the point. A lot of them would say, Michael, you know, you're special. You need to know that. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. I literally was like, oh, they're just trying to boost my self-esteem. They're just being nice. And, and now I realize, like, no, they weren't just being nice. They were saying, look, you're different. You have the gift. I've had very, very spiritual people, you know, the whole, like, energy healing people, et cetera, say the same, same damn thing. And again, I was like, oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, it's nice. And I remember one person like, we're not being nice. Like, you need to know who you are. And that's what I'm saying to you. You are special. You literally were chosen by God. Literally. Because no matter what they did, your heart wouldn't close. And even if it closed temporarily, some of us went through that. But you prayed for it to be open. You prayed to connect with God. And it did. And God's like, yep, you're my kind. I gotcha. Remember, God loves you 100% period, end of sentence. If anyone, especially if it's a church person, a pastor, a minister says, oh, you're a sinner. Now, don't do this, but literally, if we could go back in the time when this was loud, you should smack the shit out of them. 
just to make clear the people that are just going along with the crowd I'm not saying that God turned on them or anything like that but it's like they're just like like he said in the Bible about the Jewish people but I, I think this really applies to the to the herd regardless of what race religion creed you belong to he said they're stiff-necked people they won't learn they they, they think it's about rules you know well, I'll give them a bunch of commandments so they don't kill each other but really as Jesus said love love is the fulfillment of all all the commandments but honestly like no nah, no nah, no nah, that can't be right it's got to be about rules so it's kind of an exhausting job you know to get someone to realize like I'm telling you it's about love You know, there's this Christian channel on YouTube. Uh, I saw this about four or five days ago, and, and and they're all like, "Yeah, you know, those spiritual people. You know, they're not close to God. You know, you got to follow the rules." And I'm like, "Oh my God! Like, you just literally don't get it." And I said, "Well, you you do know that Jesus was a pretty spiritual guy, <laughs> and he did a lot of spiritual things, like heal people, turn water into wine, walk on water, and you know, I just rambled off a bunch of stuff." And nobody responded. They were just kind of like, oh. <laughs> they don't like it when their sheep herd mentality is pointed out like that. They just kind of shut down like, oh, okay. But they don't want to let go of it. They are hiding behind their logic. They're hiding behind rules. They think that's what's going to keep them safe. And it's not. It's just going to keep them hidden. Hey, God bless you. If you've got this far, I think this message is probably going to change your life. If you like this video, please click subscribe, click the like button, go ahead and make a comment. And remember, when you click subscribe, there's going to be a set of bells that pop down. Click the all bell if you want to receive these messages on a regular basis, okay? That's it. If you want to make a donation, there is a donation link, a PayPal link, right there in the description box beneath the video. God bless you guys. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.